welcome to the first lecture of the course introduction to general relativity so as mentioned in the introductory video we will adopt the following viewpoint that is we will start from the newton's theory of gravity and try to make it comparable with the laws of relativity and that will lead us to einstein general theory of relativity and keeping this in mind we will start by giving important concepts from newton's theory of gravity followed by recap several things from special relativity where we also introduce important things like stress energy moment of density which will be very useful when we uh, go to general relativity so let's start with the first part that is the recap of newton's theory of gravity so we all know that the newton's law of um, gravity is encoded inside this formula so the f uh, which denotes the gravitational force between two object 1 and 2 uh, is given by this inverse square law type uh, expression that x1 x2 are the position vectors of the two objects and m1 m2 are termed as gravitational charges or the gravitational mass and g newton is an universal constant we call it newton constant and uh, this is a force of attraction there is a negative sign here also this f is known as action at a distance because the effect propagates instantaneously and we know that it uh, contradicts the principles of relativity also at this point we are very careful uh, in distinguishing between gravitational mass uh, which we denote by m of g from its counterpart the inertial mass which is defined by newton's second law f equal to m so m of i denotes the inertial mass but both of them actually measures the amount of quantity possessed by this body so uh, we expect that they are related by some monotonic functions which is what it here later we will fix this f by invoking the equivalence principle which is also uh, experimentally tested so now we will uh, discuss gravitational field and the potential so if we have a bunch of point particle with the corresponding gravitational mass m1 m2 m3 etc and we take a test mass uh, and place it at the point x then the force on this test mass is given here and now in the limit when m tends to 0 that is it's a very small test object we can define the gravitational field at point x uh, and the expression is quoted now we can easily show that the curl of f is 0 that is it's a conservative force which implies that curl of g the gravitational field is 0 so we can write g as uh, gradient of a scalar function uh, which we denote by capital phi and this is known as the scalar potential and for the uh, this n particle or n point masses the expressions of it is given and we uh, mostly work in three spatial dimension unless it's stated otherwise and now we can generalize all this expression for the continuous uh, distribution so let's take this uh, uh, extended object and we pick up a very small volume uh, located at x prime so the amount of a gravitational mass inside this small volume is the uh, density times the infinitesimal volume and if we replace all these mi's by this delta m in the previous formula we get the corresponding expression for gravitational field and the potential uh, uh, for this extended distribution also remember that we have to replace the sum by the integral and if you do this properly we will get uh, the expression for g and get left uh, which is shown in this box note that the integral is over the x prime x prime is the point which is inside the extended body and it is integrated over now it is easy to show that uh, if we use this expression we get that del dot g is minus 4 pi g newton times uh, rho the density and this is nothing but the gauss law which you have seen in electrostatic as well and also del square phi del square is the three dimensional laplacian 4 pi g newton times density and this is nothing but the poisson equation and remember that while deriving this equation we have used this following uh, identity for the dirac delta function if you are not familiar you are encouraged to go back and look it so and if you try to solve this equation uh, uh, to get the phi at a point which is outside the extended object as shown in the figure so this is the extended object and you are trying to solve this 
uh, gravitational potential at x, which is outside this body, then uh, rho at x is zero, then you have to simply solve this uh, Laplace equation. Now, mm, uh, while solving these equations, uh, one has to think about the existence and uniqueness of the solution as well as stability of the solutions. And these important properties we can summarize uh, by these three theorems. So, and let's discuss uh, one by one. First is the uniqueness theorem. Suppose you want to solve a point of the equation in a bounded region, and then the solution is unique if the potential is specified at the boundary. You have to specify it at every point um, on the boundary of the region, or you have to specify its normal derivative at each point at the boundary. So, in the former case, it is called a Dirichlet boundary condition, and in the later case, it's called the Neumann boundary condition. And given this boundary condition, I, one of them, uh, you get a unique solution. Next is the mean value theorem. So if the potential satisfy the Laplace equation, uh, that is, we are solving it for a uh, point outside the extended uh, object, then phi at a point xp is equal to uh, the average over phi um, over a surface of a sphere centered around this so uh, let's uh, consider this point xp and draw a sphere uh, with radius capital R, and then we take phi x and average over surface of this sphere, and which is shown in this uh, by the surface integral. And ds is the element, uh, surface element uh, of the sphere centered at the point. And last is the Anshan theorem. So it uh, again says that if phi x obeys the Laplace equation and systems, consisting of such body cannot be in a stable static equilibrium. The implication of this is that, that uh, our solar system or even our atoms cannot uh, consist of uh, static bodies. So the constituents must move. So we encourage you to look into the proof of these three uh, theorems. Uh, and you will encounter them in electrostatic as well. Also uh, try to write down uh, general, uh, form of the general solution of the Poisson equation using the green functions. And that will be useful later on. Also. Now uh, we move on to discussion of gravitational potential energy. Remember that for a pair of point particles uh, with gravitational mass in my mg and located at the point xi and xj, uh, the gravitational potential energy is given by this. And this is a negative definite quantity uh, because uh, this is an attractive force. And we can generalize it for n point particle, which is basically you have to sum over all possible pair. And i greater than j basically uh, gives the restriction such that you don't overcome. And if you want to remove this uh, i greater than j restriction, you have to put a factor half here. And for n uh, number of particles, this expression generalizes. Similarly, we can also generalize this for continuum case. And for continuous distribution, the gravitational potential energy is by this, you just have to replace the sum by integration and mi by rho times d3x and uh, you get this equation. So recall that the gravitational potential at point x is given by this. And using this, uh, you can uh, rewrite the uh, expression for capital U as the integral of over uh, rho times phi. Now in the Newtonian theory, uh, it says that the entire energy should be stored in the object itself because Newtonian theory is not a field theory, but it, the relativistic theory of gravitation is a field theory where the gravitational field itself will contain a part of energy moment. Now, even uh, working in the Newtonian theory, we can make some heuristic derivation to get an expression for the energy stored in the gravitational field. And let's do that. So first, let's rewrite this uh, u. Uh, in terms of these two keys. So we are breaking down these two expressions. Uh, at this point, you should remember this breakdown is quite ad hoc. In, uh, but later we will justify this when we discuss the uh, relativistic generalization of this and get the appropriate expression for this energy stored in the field, which will match with the derived expression in the non relativistic limit. So, but let's continue for the moment. So we claim the first piece is the uh, energy that is stored inside the matter. And the second piece is the energy uh, that is stored inside the field. 
and let's look at the u uh, second piece more closely so we start with the expression which is minus half integral over rho times phi and we use the Poisson equation to replace this rho and then we rewrite this laplacian by doing the integration by parts and it will give two terms so first term if you look at carefully you can use the gauss divergence theorem and uh, make this uh, volume integral to a surface integral and then we have a second term which is entirely volume integral uh, of del phi whole square so if you look at the surface integral and if you consider our surface at a very large distance away that is at infinity and we are only considered localized mass distribution that is the distribution does not itself reach to the surface at infinity so we have seen that phi falls off as one of our mod of x the element the surface element uh, goes as uh, proportional to mod x square we think about this is a very large sphere with uh, some uh, radius so the surface area goes of r square then this entire integral will uh, falls as one of our mod of x and in x uh, tends to infinity limit the first term will vanish then we will uh, left with only the second term and then uh, you can write down the energy stored in the gravitational field as in a, some volume integral uh, which is shown here and this is a volume integral so you can define an energy density uh, which is shown here and you can then uh, use the fact that your g the gravitational field is del phi uh, uh, del phi and then you can rewrite this entire expression in terms of uh, g square so uh, once you do that you can see that this is true even when rho equal to zero that is given in the region without any matter field and that is why we call this the energy stored in the gravitational field later we will derive it more systematically and we will match uh, with the relativistic ex uh, our expression by taking appropriate limit with this one so keep this in mind it will serve as a useful check uh, later on now uh, uh, we will discuss an important concept which is the multiple expansion uh, so we newton derived uh, for a spherical body of mass n that the potential at a point uh, x outside this uh, spherical body is given by this which is same as a point mass uh, capital m located at the center of the sphere but for a non spherical body uh, this uh, expression will have some corrections and these corrections are captured systematically by something called a multiple expansion and now uh, let's uh, look into it a little bit more detail so let's take this uh, extended object and uh, we choose our uh, coordinate system such that the center of the coordinate system is located at the center of mass of this extended body and now let's take a very small element located at x prime uh, with respect to this origin and we wanted to calculate the gravitational potential at a point x uh, uh which is denoted by this p uh, so the position vector of this uh, point is this x so now this is given by this uh, formula that uh, we have discussed earlier so now let's assume that this point p is very very large away from all the points inside this extended body in this case let's assume that x is very large compared to the x prime then what you can do is that you take this uh, one over mod of x minus x prime and Taylor expand around x prime equal to zero. And if you do that order by order, you get this. So uh, please do this uh, exercise by yourself to get uh, familiarized uh, with this uh, uh, calculation. It's fairly simple. And you can simplify this by taking the derivative. Your ij indices uh, label the coordinate. Remember that we are working in three dimensions. So there are three coordinates. So ij is one, two, three. You can think about its so yz coordinate. And repeated indices here is mean summed over. And after you simplify this expression, we can plug this inside the phi and you get a, uh, uh, some terms uh, order by order. So first term, you can see this, the, we call the monopole term because it just comes from a point mass uh, located at the center. And if you are considering a spherical object, you can show that this is the only contribution. Second term in this series, we call the dipole contribution. So D is the dipole vector, which is defined here. And you can see that it vanishes about center of because this is basically the definition of center of mass. If you fix your origin, the uh, di vanishes. 
So dipole contribution typically vanishes in the center of mass uh, frame. And the next term is the quadrupole uh, return. And QIJ is the quadrupole tensor, which is a symmetric rank two tensor. We will elaborate more about uh, this tensor later on. And this is given here. But you can look at it from the expression that if you interchange I and J, the QIJ is equal to QJ. And of course, IJ is takes three values, one, two, three. And similarly, the this term is the octopole uh, uh, contribution, which comes from octopole uh, tensor, which is defined here. It is a symmetric rank three tensor. And uh, you can see that the analogy with the electrodynamic you have encountered there also this kind of um, dipole, quadrupole, octopolar term. And the name is uh, comes from the fact that these potentials come from this corresponding uh, distribution for the dipole is uh, shown here in this cartoon. Um, and the quadrupole is shown. If you take two dipole, you can make the octopole. If you take two octopole, you can make the quadrupole, and so on. And one important thing is to note here that even in the center of mass frame, these um, uh, quadrupole and octopole terms are non vanishing for the gravitational case, but the dipole term is vanishing. And uh, last but not the least, you should uh, able to show that if you take a spherical uh, uh, mass distribution, then these quadrupole terms and etc. identically vanishes. And we leave that exercise for you to do. So we will end here. And for more details, please also refer to the associated lecture notes.